Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Resources, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Berkeley College, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, and by MagnaCare. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey, and by Commerce Magazine. I'm Steve Adubato. It was my pleasure uh, to talk about stroke and everything connected to it. Uh, Dr. Charles Prestigiacomo, uh, Chief of Service, Department of Neurological Surgery, University Hospital. Doctor, good to see you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, sir. It's been a while since we've had you on public television talking about stroke. A lot has happened in the past 10 years. Talk about it. Very much so. Uh, when you had us uh, here 10 years ago, we were talking about uh, the new concepts of trying to treat stroke from going inside blood vessels and taking out the clots. In the last 10 years, we've had newer devices, more efficient devices, and effective ways of doing it, uh, such that we're now saving a lot more lives. And uh, the actual data has demonstrated that intra-arterial therapy, that is, working through the arteries to take out these clots, helps save the lives and make people better. Dr. Take a step back. I don't want to assume that people actually know what a stroke is. Good what point. Is it? A stroke is a pretty broad encompassing term that uh, discusses the idea of injury to the brain secondary to either lack of blood flow or to big blood clots that develop around the brain or inside the brain. The ones that I'm talking about specifically today are when a clot enters a blood vessel and blocks flow to that part of the brain and then that part of the brain dies. So, so the brain needs constant blood flow. Yes. The clot stops the blood from flowing into the brain. Right. When that happens, what happens to the brain? Within minutes, you start losing brain cells. And it's been shown, based on some of the number calculations that we've done, uh, that you can lose 32,000 brain cells a second. That's over a million point eight cells a minute. Uh, and brain cells do not regenerate. And so we need to abort that. We need to stop that from happening. Why is it that I've heard the expression again and again, time is brain? What does uh, that mean? That's a great question. Time is brain is exactly that point that you have uh, precious minutes to preserve these brain cells uh, by providing them the blood flow and the necessary oxygen that they need to survive. And the blood clot that we just talked about prevents that from happening. And so every second, literally, that we uh, save from that lack of uh, blood flow, we save 32,000 cells that never regenerate. And so, so that's where it goes. Sorry for interrupting. People watching us public on public television, Fios listening on radio right now, you want to give them advice. What are the signs? Actually, there's a very close friend of the public television family. Um, he knows who he is, and he knows who his family member is. <clears throat> Searing pain in her eye, said she couldn't see. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was a stroke immediately into the hospital. It was that time within 10 minutes that a particular pill was given and you know what the pill was. Mm -hmm. What was it? Uh, it was probably the TPA, the yes, IV TPA. What is that and why it, explain that right. and uh, in terms of symptoms. That searing pain, unable to see in, out of one eye, that's only one symptom. Go to some of the others. That's correct. Um, the other symptoms are difficulty finding words or speaking. The most classic one is not being able to move a part of your body. Uh, a facial droop, that is when so one side of your face sags. All of these can be signs of a, an impending stroke. They can also sometimes be other things. But the problem is that because stroke and its outcome is so severe and so debilitating, it's better to err on the part of caution. Assume it's a stroke? And, yes. Absolutely. So it's just like you're overreacting, you say? No. Get it checked out. Work on it. Make sure that it is not a stroke because it's better to overreact 
and be healthy than to wait an hour, two hours, three hours, lose millions, billions of brain cells. Age and then, matter. Uh, age does matter. Unfortunately, the older you get, the harder it is to recover from a stroke. Also, the more likely it is that you will have a stroke. Really? Yes. Because? Um, just because of the blood vessels and the way the blood vessels age, uh, because some people have high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, um, dietary habits. Well, go back. I'm sorry again mm -hmm. for interrupting. Let's talk about the fact some of it's genetic. Correct. Beyond the stuff you can't control, the genetic issues, mm -hmm. what are the things that we do that create risk factors for ourselves that elevate the potential of a stroke? Right. You said smoking. Right. So these are the modifiable risk factors. So smoking is one of them. Controlling your diabetes, although you can have diabetes when you're born, and that's the insulin-dependent kind, if you control your sugars, that helps tremendously. Diet can cause diabetes. That's the secondary type of diabetes. That, again, you can control because the sugars can damage the blood vessels. So controlling your sugars are important. Blood pressure, very important in controlling your blood pressure because that damages your um, blood vessels as well. And then general weight just making sure that your weight is appropriate and that you're exercising and staying healthy. People have uh, been involved with a lot of stressful jobs and mm -hmm. positions, and I think that creates some problems in the body as well. Before I let you out of here, mm -hmm. tremendous advancement. You can't prevent it, but is the likelihood of a stroke less because of the developments, or is the treatment better because of the development? It's actually perfectly well said. It's the treatment and the development of these treatments that are now allowing us uh, to improve patients' outcomes. Recovery better? Recovery from a stroke that only lasts a few minutes will always be better than a stroke that is there forever. Absolutely. You're treating it differently? Yes. That's how we're using these intra-arterial or these uh, devices through the arteries to literally pull the clot out explain or to it. You suck go, the clot explain out. Explain it real quick. It goes through the... So it goes through the groin into the artery okay, and the guys, groin. Pull back if you could. Keep, 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 pull back a little bit. Get this. Go ahead. And so you put it through the artery and the groin, which can then travel the catheter up into the base of the neck. Right. We bring a small catheter, as small, as thin, as cooked angel hair pasta, into the area where the clot is, and we deploy either a device that can capture the clot and pull it out, or we can actually use suction techniques to literally suck the clot right out. And you didn't do that how long ago? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we were trying to dissolve it with a chemical uh, agent and then trying to macerate it with various tools and devices. Now we have the devices wow. that are literally designed and built specifically for that function. We need to do everything we can to avoid the possibility of a stroke, but if in fact it happens, there are treatments, but you cannot recover those brain cells, but you've got to move quickly and assume the possibility, doctor, if I'm hearing you correctly, that it could be a stroke, get immediately to the hospital. Absolutely. 80 to 90 percent of people that have strokes come to the hospital too late, and therefore we can't help them. The fifth leading cause of death in the United States affects 795 thousand people and killing almost 130 thousand people a year. That's what we're talking about strokes. Doctor, thank you for uh, updating us. It will not be another 10 years, I promise you. It's an important subject. Thank you, doctor. Pleasure having you. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by Karen Gorzinski, who is choral director at Somerville High School, part of our NJA partnership, Classroom Close-Up, a great series that you can see on uh, our sister station, uh, NJTV. You watch Classroom Close-Up. Yes, I do. It's a great series, right? It's wonderful. Well, you're in it. I'm in it. Tell everyone why. Uh, Somerville High School Chamber Choir has a wonderful... Uh, relationship with the students at the Midland School. Describe the Midland School. Midland School is a wonderful nonprofit school for special education, uh, meeting the needs of many developmentally disabled students. So your choral group gets together with their choral group once a year. Once a year. Magic happens? 
I would say so. So you say it. I've read about it. Classroom Close Up featured it. You haven't seen the video. I haven't seen the video. The way this is set up is they didn't want us to see it until we see it together here in the public television studio. How's that? That's great. Classroom Close Up, it's a powerful video. Check it out. Some nights I stay up, cashing in my bag. Karen Gorzinski and the chamber choir of Somerville High work hard to create great harmonies. But today will be about much more than perfect technique. For the past seven years, Karen's choir has held a joint concert with Linda Lara's choir at the Midland School, which specializes in the care and development of special needs students. In 2007, I was nominated for a Somerset County Arts Teaching Award. I did not receive the award, but Linda Lara did. And I was so moved by her work that I made sure I met her and congratulated her, but also said, I would love for my choir to work with your choir. And I said, I'm all for that because we need uh, experiences with the community for our students. Karen and I get along beautifully and music is the unifying experience for us. And so we just went with it. Uh, Mrs. Lara said Gabby is super, super excited. Not only to have a solo, but to be sharing it with somebody. That you're, she's gonna go back and forth with you know, with someone else is very exciting. So, yeah, I'm already gonna cry, so. <laughs> All right. I'm really excited, because this is always one of my favorite trips out of the year, and the music department here does a lot of them, but this is, like, the number one that we all look forward to. Having gone last year, um, the nervous energies have gone away because I've already been there, and it's just a lot of fun. This is another example of the universal language bringing people together. I feel like it could heal the world. It's awesome. Hi, Ellen, how are you? Somerville High is warmly welcomed by the Midland School with high fives. Hi, Vinny Hi. 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 I remember you from last year. And plenty of hugs. The day will include a pizza luncheon and a concert for the Midland School faculty and students. It's just a beautiful moment to be singing with everybody and especially sharing the solo with Gabby. Like I was able to sing with her and just make music with her and it was wonderful. It was great. I feel confident to sing Let It Go from the whole school. Sometimes I get nervous, but Mrs. Lara just says, just let it go. <laughs> it doesn't matter what language you speak, what ability or disability you have, everyone enjoys music and, and can be brought together with music. The concert made me feel most excited and happy. I, I love my students, <laughs> and I am very proud, very proud of what they did today. They have big hearts. Go ahead. Um, I'm glad that really captures what we do. It's, it's a wonderful um, collaboration. It makes me proud of my kids again when I see it. Well, I was really proud that day, but to, to see it, that, that's really what we're doing. I can't believe it. I'm happy other people are gonna see it. A lot of people are gonna see it. What do your kids get out of it? Uh, boy, they get so many things. Obviously, uh, what music can do to bring people together but I think on a whole different level, it opens their hearts to uh, accepting students with special needs. Um, they would not be together unless we took this trip because once a parent decides to put their child in Midland, there's no inclusion like in public school. So we have to physically go there for those kids to experience inclusion. And I think it's important. I really think it's super valuable. I think other teachers should find ways to reach out to special needs schools. They don't meet until the day of. Correct. But there's some carryover from the year mm. before. So some of them knew yeah. each other, a lot of them did not. Why did you reach out for Linda, the other teacher? Why did you do that? I was so moved by her having a choir in that school. I had no idea what went on at Midland School. And that she has a choir with those kids was so powerful to me. And I, I just thought more people should know about it. And if I brought my kids there, more people would know, and now we ended up on Classroom Close-Up, so now even more people will know. Yeah. Why did you go into teaching? 
Oh, I just love kids. I would have taught, I, I thought maybe I was going to teach English. I didn't know what I was going to teach until I was in high school, but I knew I was going to teach. This experience with your kids together with the Midland kids, what has it done for you? It gives me, well, it's a great source of pride, but it gives me hope. Like, I hope that I am instilling in my students so much more than just the ability to read music, but to use music as a tool for good. Music as a tool for good. It's a lifelong interest. They can do it forever. They can use it to bring people together. They can use it for themselves if they're feeling down. You can join a choir somewhere. You can use it for your whole life. Is music some sort of, as it was described, universal language? Absolutely. Absolutely. You look at our society in times of trouble, people gather and sing. Sorrow, yeah. we sing. <clears throat> Joy, we sing. I got to ask you this. Um, for about a year now, I've asked people of all stripes who are leaders the most significant leadership lesson they've learned after watching you on Classroom Close Up and seeing the kind of leader you are. I need to ask you, as an educator, as a person, as a professional in your field, what is the most significant leadership lesson you've learned? Hmm. It's a great question. I feel, in the way I lead, um, we have got to teach the whole child. That concerns me, that we're, we focus on testing and those types of things, which is very important. But I was strongly led by my music teachers because it, it just fills um, human spaces that need to be encouraged rather than strictly academic areas. Teachers are leaders. Every day. Karen Gorzinski, choral director at Somerville High School, is a terrific leader, an even better person. Glad you're in the classroom. On behalf of all the parents who have their children in public school, I say this every time. I just want to repeat it with you. Thank you for everything you do every day for our kids. Thank you for having me. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Mitch Rothschild, who is uh, chairman and founder of an organization called, a company called Vitals. Vitals is? Vitals is a web service and a phone-based service that helps you make intelligent choices about finding health care knowing who's good, what other patients think, what it costs, and allowing you to make an informed decision in an area where most of us have not made informed decisions in the past. How does it work? Break it down for us. So uh, when you need health care, you're going to try to look for a particular doctor, a particular facility. You want to know what other patients think of them. We've got more mm -hmm. patient ratings than anybody else. You want to know if they're any good, if they've done that procedure. You're also going to want to know what it costs. Mm -hmm. And so we partner with a lot of health plans so that we can tell you your out-of-pocket cost before you go, as opposed to just waiting a couple weeks, getting the bill, and having no idea if that bill is $20 or $400. Um, and so we'll help you with quality, cost, uh, in some cases help you make an appointment. And if we are working with your health insurer or your employer, uh, we will occasionally uh, give you financial incentives to help you uh, make intelligent choices about where to get your care. But you had an experience, personally, that was eye-opening. Describe yeah, it. Indeed. Um, I'm a weekend warrior. Do uh, sports here. <laughs> Do there sport. should be a club called Weekend Warriors. But <laughs> <Yes>. go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, hopefully a little more frequent than that as, as, yeah. uh, as I age. And uh, I tore my Achilles and needed to get it operated on, obviously, for repair. And to make small talk on my way to the operating room, the orthopedist said to me, I'm glad you're here. I don't get to do that many uh, Achilles uh, in the course of a year. Oh, that'll build confidence. Right. And that, that was, I felt that that was something I should have known. Immediately, the anesthesiology cone came down over my face. I fell asleep. When I woke up, I fortunately remembered that that was the kind of information I felt I should know beforehand. So we started collecting data on procedure volumes, quality of physicians, uh, quality of hospitals, 
and built that up. We now have website vitals.com that gets about 10 million people a month that come and visit the site, leave ratings, get information, find out. We also work closely with a number of health plans to uh, be their website, the front door for, say, um, Blue Cross of Illinois or First Care or Primera and others and help tell people the cost before they get care. So how do you, how do you actually, so I want to be clear on this because mm -hmm. my information is that you don't charge consumers. Correct. Well, but how do you make money? We, um, so our, our primary audience is the patient, the consumer, and we, in general on the web, we don't charge money. We will get paid either by the, what are called the payers, the health plans oh, okay. or the employers for generating the cost, for delivering the information. Got it. And on our website for consumers, we have advertising, uh, okay, pharmaceutical is, advertising. Okay, got it. But there's another initiative. Um, is it called S Smart Shopper? Smart Shopper. What is yes. that? So Smart Shopper is really an innovation that we started about a year and a half ago with a company that we merged with. And that is when you're past your deductible, uh, as a patient, you don't really care what something costs. So there are wide disparities in cost of, say, an MRI at an imaging center is $500, at a hospital might be $2,500. Uh, almost the same quality, in some cases better. And so we will uh, encourage you by sending you a check and helping you share in the savings by going to the less expensive ones. And we do that with MRIs and CAT scans and colonoscopies and infusion drugs and lab work and all the places where uh, the choice of facility would help you, uh, would save money for the system and we want to save money for the system. We def describe ourselves sometimes as being an anti-GNP company. We actually lower <laughs> the gross national product of the United States because we're taking costs out of the system. That would be a good idea though, uh, in that case. In this case, obviously, as a society that is aging and getting sick, though any way you can take some costs out of the systems to avoid rationing or price increases is a good thing. And so um, there has been a gro huge growth lately of freestanding facilities that deliver care. If you were 10, 12 years ago, you might get most of your care either at a doctor's office or a hospital. Today, you have telemedicine, you have imaging centers, you have urgent care centers, you have infusion centers, you have ambulatory surgery centers, you have clinics. Confusing uh, for consumers? Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's confusing. They don't really know. And little by little, people begin to get knowledge of it. So one place to take an example is a flu shot. Fifteen years ago, you're getting a flu shot at your doctor. Today, most flu shots happen at CVS and Walgreens. I was just going to say, CVS, I was in the other day. Right. You want your flu shot? Is that something we need to know? Does it matter where we get it? It's much less expensive for the system because to get a flu shot, you don't need somebody who went to medical school okay. and had residency to deliver that to you. And so we're able to deliver that care as a society for much less cost. Similar things happen with... Uh, any machinery you use for CAT scans and MRIs, drugs that you get infused in you, labs. There's a company called Theranos now that um, with one drop of blood can do all your lab work. Uh, telemedicine is a much less expensive way to get uh, care. An urgent care center instead of an emergency room. So there's all these places. One second, but does Vitals give information? Because obviously in public television, we're not here to advocate any product, any service, any anything. But I just want to be clear, does Vital give information and evaluate these services and this technology in a way that the consumer can make his or her own choice? Absolutely. We are provider agnostic. The industry we're in provider is... Provider agnostic. I like that. Yes. So the industry we're in is transparency. No horse in a race. Right. We want you to get the best quality care at the best possible price that you can get into in a reasonable period of time. And so we'll display the options for you the same way you'll get a search result on Google. And you can choose. You might want to go quicker and pay a little more. Mm. You might want the best guy and travel a little further. Mm. You might want to save some money or get a check. And you as a consumer decide. Before I let you out of here, uh, you've had a lot of businesses. You're a very successful entrepreneur. Clearly, you've had many other businesses before this as well. So... You don't expect this question. Number one leadership challenge, excuse me. Yeah, the number one leadership challenge you have faced. I usually ask the number one leadership lesson. The number one leadership challenge you have faced in your career as an entrepreneur is? Uh, fascinatingly, I would say when you get a business to the size of 15 million in revenue, 
uh, you just have to change the way you do things to be able to scale and grow. And we've been blessed that we've been growing 50, 60 percent a year in vitals. And uh, the example that somebody once told me is if you're a cabinet maker and you make four cabinets a week. A few seconds, go ahead. Um, if you make uh, six cabinets, you can do it. If you get an order for a thousand cabinets, you're in another business. The leadership <laughs> challenge is to be able to reinvent your business to be able to grow and scale and not to do the same things the same way. Great stuff, Mitch. All the best at uh, Vitals. We appreciate it. Come back and give us an update. Thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Resources, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Berkeley College, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by MagnaCare. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Seeing science in action makes students realize they can learn. What is that word now called? Elizabeth. With the right tools, it's easy to motivate students. Students need to know science to succeed in the global economy. That's why NJE established the Center for Teaching and Learning. To give teachers the training to make science come alive and to keep New Jersey schools among the best in the nation. That's why we are so proud to teach in New Jersey's public schools.